In the beginning, the Earth was a feral planet. It was not the marble blue Earth we treasure today. Instead, it was covered in volcanic red and burnt oranges. Hundreds of volcanoes dotted the terrain and belched out fire and sulfur. The planet was covered with lava, and our atmosphere was toxic. But trapped somewhere deep and close to Earth's core were the ingredients to create the most life-sustaining element: water. For thousands of years. It's believed that as volcanoes coughed out black steam, it released other gases buried deep inside the Earth's core that had been trapped near the center of the Earth since its formation. With the exhale of these gases, slowly the molten planet. Began to cool, and when the gases turned into clouds, the world began to rain, and it rained, biblical rains, a storm that marked the beginning of the earth as we know it, a cleansing ceremony. As it rained for thousands of years, the crusty land hardened, and the basins filled up. However, scientists suggest that these rains only account for half of the Earth's oceans. The other half came from space. As the Earth began to calm down, our solar system was still wild and unruly. The planets' orbits, carved into our solar system like record tracks, were still finding their groove. Rogue intergalactic rocks from far-off corners of our multiverse. Flung themselves into Earth, comets caked in ice smashed into Earth, over and over and over again. A daily reminder that the rest of the universe is always within reach. These icy layers melted. As the comet burned through our stratospheres and rained down into our oceans, slowly filling it up until it hit a limit: 332 million 519,000 cubic miles of water sit on our planet. Our oceans. Stopped filling up at the perfect height for the continents to rise out of, followed by life. And although we left the water, the water didn't leave us. It's 80 percent of our body, and we can't go more than three days without drinking it. It's more important to our health than kale or CrossFit. It's a drink. It's a bath. It's a cloud. It's a tear. Put some heat under it, and the water chemicals begin to dance and shake, like they're at a club. That boiling point turns liquid into steam, and we small humans eventually learned how to harness its almighty power. Trains and ships exhale steam as it gobbles up coal. What moves our cells in our body also moves us around the world. 
and out of all of the billions of planets and rocks floating out in the universe. As far as we know, we're the only ones to have water flowing around ours and in the bodies of every life form. But water isn't always our friend. It has no allegiance to the animals that rely on it. And in 1890, one woman will experience every stage of water's intensity and the rageful ways of Mother Nature. I'm Adrian Bain, and this is Strangers Abroad, a race around the world based on the true story of Elizabeth Bisland. As Elizabeth Bisland wishes that she didn't have to rush around the world, there is one man whose job it has been to part the seas and get her home as quickly as possible. JBW has been bribing, sweet-talking, and negotiating with every steamship or train official on Elizabeth's path. He would have bargained with Neptune himself if given the opportunity. JBW has been shameless and he spent a small fortune ensuring that Liz had the fastest trip around the world. He still had one more big push up his sleeve. The last big connection that Liz needs to grab is a steamship called Le Champagne. The steamship is set to leave from Le Havre, the corner where Nelly entered France. When Liz gets on Le Champagne, it is expected to arrive in New York on January 26th, getting her home in 74 days. JBW is making sure of that. He doesn't just call the steamship company, he calls the French government because the steamship is carrying tons of mail across the Atlantic and is regulated by the French Postal Service. It's a big gamble on his part. But when have governments refused a little extra spending money? So, as JBW is in negotiation with the French government, Liz heads toward Italian soil. Day 62, January 15th. On the evening of January 15th, Liz sails towards Brindisi's Harbor. She spends the whole time in the Mediterranean wrapping herself in her kimonos, staring out her porthole, and looking at the tiny Greek islands in the distance. She loves staring out at these Elysian waters for days on end, envisioning all of the different civilizations sailing towards and away from each other. She had an easy ride through the Red Sea, the Suez Canal, and an uneventful time in Port Said. Once the sun sets, she organizes her luggage for her quick but chaotic ride through Europe. Now, Elizabeth has not been as miserly as Nellie. Anything Liz wanted, she purchased obviously for the good of the local economy. Liz's box overflows with goods. She's procured over seven stops. It is so stuffed 
that it needs to be intentionally packed and a stewardess has to sit on her trunk in order for Liz to lock it shut. Otherwise, everything will pop out like a jack-in-the-box. So after getting a workout from packing, Liz heads off to bed so she can be well-rested for her long ride through Europe. Then, as she settles in for the night, a bittersweet feeling twists inside her stomach. She's almost in Europe, But that means that her trip is almost over. Day 63, January 16th. On the afternoon of January 16th, 65 days into the race, Liz sees the outline of Italy. The air has that early autumnal crispness what she's used to feeling in November in New York. But she doesn't have time to mosey through the ancient streets of Italy. Liz has to catch a train that is leaving within the hour of her arriving in Brindisi. She has to do everything she can to get to northern France ASAP. When they dock, Liz tries to enjoy the sea breeze, the white city outline, the smell of olives and rosemary, while everyone else is pushy, anxious, and irritated. After weeks of lazy, slow ship life, suddenly everyone on board is in a rush to get off. Liz's fellow passengers push, squeeze, and shove people around, thinking they're the most important person who needs to get off immediately. The anxiety is palpable as the tightly packed line waits with their heavy steam trunks for customs officials to inspect and register for their final destination. It is almost impossible to get anything done. The whole ship is in an uproar. Luggage is being disembarked. Many passengers are leaving for a tour through Italy before finally returning to England. Italians with cocked hats and imperial importance of manner are bullying everyone and getting things into a hopeless tangle. My luggage is finally marked as passed, and a porter is hired to transport it. Liz hops off as her luggage is taken care of and brought to her mail train. In the few moments that she has, she rushes over to a ticket office and sends her cable to JBW, informing him that she has arrived in Italy. Now, with few minutes to spare, she heads to the mail train that goes from south to north, the reverse trip that Nellie took. Liz arrives at the train 10 minutes before it's set to depart. She gets on and finds her seat. She made it. She's so ready to stare out at the Italian landscape for hours. But her gut suddenly whispers something to her. Go check your luggage. Liz isn't usually this anxious, but she goes to where all of the steamer trunks are kept, just in case. She looks around, sifts through all the other heavy trunks, and can't see hers anywhere. Where is it? Where is my trunk? Liz's blood curdles and she jumps into action. She flings out of the car and rushes back again to the ship only to discover 
The missing possessions in the hands of an Italian who insists they have not been properly examined and demands the keys. He inspects various necessary additions to my wardrobe during my voyage which have so enlarged the contents of my little box. That's right. All of those rings, silks, and kimonos are necessary. Liz tries to negotiate with this officer. I don't have time for this. My train is about to leave. My bag is to transfer to London. It doesn't need to be inspected. But this obstinate customs worker won't hear otherwise. So Liz begrudgingly has to unpack her trunk as he sniffs through all of her items like that rat in Singapore. Everyone else waiting to get their bags checked shoves and moves around with entitlement and impatience. Liz wipes the beads of sweat running down her forehead and over her top lip. I hope I did not forget the dignity a gentlewoman should preserve under the most trying of circumstances, but I fancy that my tones, while low, were concentrated. Once the worker went through all of her luggage and was satisfied, Liz shoves everything back in, completely disorganized, and hustles back to the train with a porter, knowing in her heart that her train could have already left. She fumes and darts through the crowd, going against the current of passengers every which way. As she rushes towards her train platform, she scans in the distance to see if her train is still there. And then, Liz learns the important truth about traveling through Italy. In Italian, the term on time translates to whenever. Happily, Italian trains are not bound down by narrow interpretations of timetables. And I do succeed in catching it with the luggage and some few tattered remains of one's nice temper. Liz discovers that the lackadaisical Italian ways are a blessing and a curse because her train is still there when she returned. She takes a huge exhale and steps back up onto the train and throws herself into her seat. The anxiety melts off of her, and she wipes the sweat off her face. Then she makes herself cozy and waits any second now for the train to exit the station. She waits and waits and waits and waits and waits. Now, her anxiety takes on a new form, and her body starts to heat up with impatience. When are we going to leave? 15, 30, 45 minutes go by, and Liz starts to get a little twisted about the Italian's lack of promptness. Finally, an hour behind time, the train pulls out of the station and her two-day trip to the north begins. As the train picks up speed, Liz gets a full scope of the scenery. She takes a breath and decides to forgive the Italians because of Italy. She admires the rolling amber and green hills. Long cypress trees rise like towers, 
and quaint houses sit along the placid and blue Adriatic. JBW receives Liz's telegram that evening. It's confirmed that she caught the mail train and it left at 1.45 in the afternoon. But Italian time, so no one really knows when it was. This guaranteed that Liz can connect with the steamship La Champagne that will sail from La Havre, scheduled to arrive in New York on January 26th. JBW double checks with the steamship company that they can make a quick passage for Liz. And will wait for Liz if she is a little behind time. Nellie Bly is scheduled to arrive in San Francisco on the 22nd. And if it doesn't hold her up, which JBW predicts that it will, it will take Miss Bly at least four days to get across America. Putting Nellie Bly in New York on January 26th as well. After months of mental calculation and recalculation, both women and America have the same day floating in their heads. But in JBW's mind, as long as Liz makes La Champagne, they will have champagne every night. Liz's telegram is great news. In the late afternoon of January 16th, Liz is well taken care of on the train. Since it's a tiny train, there's only one steward who had the gentleness of a butler. There is one person who attends to all of us, who is a porter, guard, steward, cook, and brakeman, and has his own ideas on the subject of haste and acts accordingly. And he delivers more than mail. He is also an unofficial traveling news reporter. When we reach a town where he has friends he goes out and winds up like a Waterbury watch, dismounts and is received with affectionate enthusiasm to a little crowd on the platform. He gives his careful attention to all the local gossip and retails the news he's been gathering all along the line. Even though it is adding time, Liz is so charmed by how the Italians get their news. The porter retires into a tiny den, and from a space but larger than a matchbox, produces delightful soups and salads, excellent coffee and well-cooked game, baskets of twisted Italian bread, wine and oranges at night. He arranges our sleeping berths, and I think he would perform our barber duties and assist us with our toilets if called upon to do so. Although Liz is comfortable, she can't help but be concerned about this extreme delay. The Italians have no concern for a race. Liz needs to catch a train in the suburbs of Paris to connect to La Havre and reach La Champagne by the next morning. Since the train had a late departure and gossip added time to every stop, Liz doesn't know if she will make her connection to La Havre. So Liz and a few friends she makes on the train map out an alternative route just in case. As Liz scans over timetables and maps, she wishes she could be enjoying the scene of the Alps instead, which slowly get larger in the distance. Day 64, J. 
January 17th. On the second day of the mail train, the smooth olive hills transform in texture and the elevation rises. Tenacious grapevines and towns cling to the mountainside. Villages tuck themselves inside cliffs and white replaces green. The Alps loom in the distance like a magical winter castle. At various points, Liz pauses to stare out her window at the sight of the white-peaked Alps getting larger and larger. The folded mountains distract her from her rushing thoughts about her time. She thinks about how different they look from the Rockies. As little towns cradle the foothills and cows dot the landscape. Then her path starts to zigzag, zigzag. The Italian mail train twists around the mountains like a DNA helix. She wishes she could stare out that window forever. Then eventually, the train plunges into a tunnel. And when they appear on the other side, they're welcomed into sunny, chilly France. Liz immediately notices the disparity between the Italian and French resources. Everything is quite different all at once. A new fortress commands the tunnel, and the stadium is better built and larger than those we have seen in Italy. The custom officer, a well-set-upon and good-looking Frenchman, is in a smart uniform. He inquires politely if we have anything to declare. And when we answer in the negative, his heels gather, give a profound salutation, and vexes us no more. Everywhere in an air of greater prosperity, thrift and alertness. Now at the base of France, she just has to cross this entire country. And then she is on her way home. The French train does not stop for gossip and goes at an added speed. So as Liz falls asleep, she dreams about the evolution she's gone through in two months. She left in the early New England winter and hopscotched from the tropics to the desert and now returned to snow. The winter welcomes her back as she falls asleep on the train. JBW's plan to hold La Champagne is all set. His bribe has successfully worked on the French government to hold off the ship's departure. He also arranged for the American Legion members to meet Miss Bisland at Villeneuve St. George and accompany her onto a special train to Le Havre. And floating in the English Channel is La Champagne, a mighty steamship with a great record for getting from Europe to America quickly. This massive 1,000-person passenger ship is ready to bring Liz home. Late that night, hundreds of passengers, workers, sailors, and mailmen begin to gather at La Havre and board the ship. And out of the hundreds of people and hundreds of pounds of mail, they're all persuaded to stay until one particular woman gets on board. JBW's plan is foolproof. Day 65, January 18th. 
Throughout her trip in France, Liz has been getting telegraphs telling her which route to take. She will take the special train to Villeneuve St. George, a suburb of Paris, and will get on a chartered train that is twice as fast as a regular train and will get her to the coast in three hours with enough time to board the steamship before it leaves at 7 a.m. And then she's off for America. In this telegram, Liz also learns she will be escorted by a number of gentlemen from the American Legion on her chartered train. And also in that telegram, she reads that Le Champagne has agreed to wait for her. And fortunately, the French have made up for the Italian delay. So until it's time for her to get off, she will wait for a signal. Friday night, some two hours after midnight, the guard roused me to deliver a telegram, which says I must be ready at 4 a.m. to change cars for Paris. This means leaving my box under seal for London and crossing the ocean with the few belongings in a travel bag. I rise and dress quietly, scribble a few notes of farewell to my fellow passengers who have been especially courteous. And I am ready when we halt at Villeneuve in the dark. A sadness takes over. All of her new friends and acquaintances are fast asleep. (sighs) But she has a race to finish. And she'll be on a long, lounging trip back home in no time. This flying trip is almost over. And she is equally part sad and a little relieved that home is just on the other side of this ocean. At 4.30 a.m., Liz exits the train and the station is deserted. Not even a mouse is scurrying around. It's an open-air station and freezing outside. A thick blanket of fog sits on the platform and reminds her of her days in San Francisco. It seemed like a past life by now. She looks around and finds her platform, and she waits in the misty morning hours for train lights to arrive in the distance. She wasn't waiting long until she hears someone approach her. She hears a single pair of feet forcefully coming up behind her. It's probably one of the gentlemen that JBW set up to escort her on her way. Then the pace quickens and out of the fog steps a man and he stretches out his arm to shake Liz's hands. This young Frenchman asks if she's Elizabeth Bisland. Alors, vous êtes Elizabeth Bisland? Liz nods a sleepy smile. All is fine, she's taken care of. This man introduces himself as a worker for Thomas and Cook's Sons, the largest travel agency in the world. He looks at Liz for a moment a sudden pause in his confidence, and then says, I regret to inform you that Le Champagne will not be waiting for you. I did everything in my power to have her wait for you, but the government won't allow the wait. Le Champagne is also a mail ship and has to keep its tight schedule. Without pausing to see her face fall, he wishes her luck, and evaporates as quickly as he arrived. This mysterious man didn't leave his name or any official credentials. We don't even know 
if he actually worked for Thomas and Cook's sons. All we know is that his words changed Elizabeth's fate completely. She's left out in the cold and feels confused. Why, that is so strange. It completely contradicts all the telegraphs I've been getting. I thought the boat would wait for me. Something feels off. But she isn't as upset as she should have been. Because... She doesn't know the real truth. The man had lied to her. Unbeknownst to Liz, Le Champagne waited for her to arrive on time with everyone else. Then when 7 a.m. came and went, the officers on the ship checked their watches and telegraphed JBW that Miss Elizabeth Bisland has not arrived. Then an hour goes by, then two, and the ship waits until 10 a.m. for Elizabeth. The captain is interested in this race, but when she doesn't show, JBW frantically cables La Champagne to request a longer delay. After negotiating, the French line agreed that they could hold off for a few more hours for an extra $2,000. But the company couldn't do that without the consent of the French Minister of Posts and Telegraphs. Because the ship is paid for by the French government. So Walker cables the American litigation in Paris hoping that some of their officials might exert some influence with their French minister. But eventually, it was too late. After waiting three hours for Liz, Le Champagne had to leave the dock due to the tides. But they even waited an extra 30 minutes in the harbor hoping Liz could take a tugboat out to the ship. Then, after waiting for nearly four hours for Elizabeth, the French captain receives a message ordered from the government to leave Miss Bisland behind. And they obey. Now Le Champagne a monstrous boat in the ocean becomes smaller and smaller as it sails away from France without Elizabeth. Now Liz doesn't know that any of that is happening and will happen as she walks back to the Italian mail train. Confused and a little defeated, She has to believe this mysterious agent. Liz won't know she's been intentionally misled until she reaches America. So all we know is that it took one sentence to redirect someone's entire fate and the fate of the race. But Liz does know that she has to keep moving. Now she's too awake, so she returns to the Indian mail train and throws herself onto the couch. She slumps over. Her posture is ruined from lack of sleep. All of this back and forth and confusion is starting to wear on her. She crumples up those goodbye notes. She focuses on the rising sun. Outside of lovely visions, it was worth the lost sleep to have seen. She knows she has to ride with the whims of the world. So as they cross through the Parisian suburbs and then enter the northern French countryside, Liz sketches out her new plan. Now she will take the train to Calais and take a ferry from northwestern France to England. 
She'll take a train to London and then another train to Southampton in Wales and catch the fastest steamship the next day. Now, Liz is due to be back in New York on January 27th and still under the cutoff. Although she's sad to miss Paris, this does mean she gets to go to England, the land of her ancestors. The French countryside, deep in the throes of winter, washes over her. And then she blinks and finds herself on the northern tip of France and staring out at England. Liz crosses the English Channel. The channel is gray and stormy when we start and gusts of rain splashes now and then upon the deck. The sun struggles through the clouds and turns the gloom of a stormy gray green and shifting silver. And there, boom, slowly through the mist of the white cliffs of England. Through all the whistling wind and water, Liz has never been more excited. The vibrant tropics of Ceylon, the coarseness of Aden, the delicacies of Japan are long forgotten. She's glued to her rain-coated window as she looks at the chalky white slab of rock pushing out of the water. In her mind, Everything she's done is leading up to this moment. She takes the train from Dover to London and is glued to the window the whole time. Certain characteristics are very reminiscent of Japan. The neatness and completeness of everything. The allowance of trees dispersed and ornamental fashion. Nature is so thoroughly tamed and domesticated. But where everything there in Japan is light, fragile, and fantastic, here in England it is solid, compact, and durable. While staring out the window, Liz can see history unraveling before her. From the Romans to the royals, Liz can see all that has played out in this ancient landscape. The English land swarms of phantoms, the folk of history, of romance, of poetry and fiction. They trump along the roads, prick across the fields, look over the hedges and peer. From every window I hear the clang of their armor and waving of their banners, their voices ringing in the frosty winter air, their horses who beat sound along the path. The train heads deeper into the English landscape, and soon night falls. Tiny sparks of light begin to fill up their view. Miles of incandescent lights glow from the city borders. Their halos get larger the closer she arrives and soon blur into one streak of light as she enters the capital of the world. Flashes the dome of St. Paul's towers and delicate spires and shines through many lands like windows. Parliament, House of Commerce, and we have passed over the Thames. until they pull into Charing Cross Station. Although she is in her ancestral homeland, a cloud of bad luck continues to hover over Liz. When she stands in London, the closer she gets to America, the farther it gets pulled away. Once Liz arrives, She's informed that the Ems steamship 
her backup steamer in Southampton, is no longer leaving. Every plan she hatches keeps falling through. I had meant to remain overnight in London and take the steamer at Southampton the next day. But here the news meets me that this ship has suddenly withdrawn and will not sail till late in the week. My one chance is the nightmare to Hollyhead, to catch the Bothina, which touches Queenstown in Southern Ireland the next morning. This ship, that she is now destined to go on, is known to be the slowest steamship in all of the Atlantic, the Bothina. All of these ships are ghosting on her. Now she doesn't even have a chance to explore London because she needs to be on a train to Wales in an hour and a half. Liz is running out of time and options. And she doesn't have time to send or receive any telegrams from JBW. The back and forth is fraying on her weary body, mind, and spirit. Now, filled with bitter disappointment and exhaustion, she's come so far and can't imagine failing. The brutality of travel is starting to catch up to her. She hasn't had more than a few hours of sleep in the last few days and hasn't eaten since the early morning. Liz is starting to get pushed to her limit, but she isn't left in the lurch. One of my fellow travelers, who's been most kind to me all the way from Siam, comes to my rescue and assumes all responsibility. I'm set off to the hotel to dine in company with two kind and charming fellow voyagers. While my difficulties are arranged, oh, but I am far too tired and disturbed to eat and can only crumble my bread and taste my wine. The hotel she's eating in is glamorous. Large gilded chandeliers hang down and the floor is covered with a soft velvet carpet, soft enough for Liz to sleep on. Her companions order rich, decadent French meals. This would have been the dinner she's always dreamt of, but all she can focus on is all the setbacks she's just had. Her eyes feel heavy from lack of sleep. And while she's eating, a reporter comes to talk to her from the Paris News Association. She's a little startled by this reporter because as Liz enjoyed her solitude going around the world, she's kind of forgotten that a good part of the world is in on this race. Liz rolls her eyes and sighs. She answers all of her questions minimally. She doesn't want to be bothered right now. All she can think about are the series of confusing events that have crossed her path in the last day. Would JBW fire her if she doesn't make it back in time? He's so capricious. He pushed her to go, so who knows what his expectations are now? But before she has any time to worry, it's time to get back on the train. So she says adieu to the reporter and her traveling companions, and another friend from her mail train joins her and escorts her back to the station. He has snatched his dinner, got rid of the dust of travel and into evening clothes. He brought rugs and cushions so that I may have some rest during the night and a little cake in case I grow hungry, and heaps of books and papers. My foot warmer is filled with hot water. The guard is instructed to give me his best care and attention, and away I go again, somewhat confused. 
I feel the shiver of goodness of the traveling man to the uncared for woman. The woman who knows how to accept a favor frankly and without tiresome protest and is at the same time gratefully aware that the service is a favor and not a duty makes every traveling man her faithful servitor. There is a vast amount of chivalry and tenderness distributed in the hearts of men. Liz settles in for the trip and turns her head out the window and she sees herself in the reflection of the black mirror. Just like when she left New York on that surprising November evening. So much has happened between now and then. She looks the same, but she knows that something has shifted within her. She has seen far off places, ancient ruins and majestic temples, places she couldn't have imagined. She's experienced the kindness of strangers on every corner of the planet. Although you can't see the effects of aging between two months, Liz is undeniably a changed woman. What doesn't change is her luck. As she rides out on her train headed to Wales and into a thunderstorm. Day 66, January 19th. I fall asleep from fatigue and I am shaken by horrible dreams and start awake with a cry. The train is thundering through a wild storm. I try to read, but the words dance up and down on the page. The guard comes now and then to see if I need anything. Liz can't sleep on this jostling train, and she's famished. She unwraps her little spice cake, and it is crumbly and dry. She chokes it down with a few sips of brandy. Ugh, it's like eating sand flavored with sugar. She takes bites and sips every time the train stops at every single station. Then deep in the night, I reach Hollyhead. At some ungodly hour, they finally arrive on the most northwestern tip of Wales, a nub ready to break off of the UK. And it's a straight shot to Dublin over the Irish Sea. But the boat from Hollyhead to Dublin is late. Liz still gathers her belongings and heads towards the pier. And through the dark rain, she eventually sees a small vessel, quivering and shivering, getting ready to cross the Irish Sea. Even on the calmest days of the year, it's still a four-hour journey to Ireland. The rain and sheet pelts her as she waits impatiently in the cold and darkness. She holds her arms over her chest and her back starts to ache from standing with her bags on her body. Huddled on the pier in the throes of the unforgiving weather of the British Isles. Finally, once they're ready to sail, the ship leaves Great Britain and heads to Ireland. Then once on the ship, it feels like all of the sea monsters are swimming under the water, kicking the ship with their flippers, fins, and tentacles. The night is a wild one. The wind in our teeth and the journey was rough and very tedious. 
Liz longs for stillness as she crouches on a bench, turns her spare clothes into blankets, and tries to get some shut-eye. The cold and tempest day has dawned before we touch ground, and are hurried for lack of sleep and the means of making a fresh toilet into the train for Dublin. Four grueling hours later, they arrive in Dublin in the icy Irish morning. From her boat, Liz looks through the rain-covered windows and peers at the soft sunrise break open the day. And now, because of the boat's delay in Wales, Liz has no time to put herself together she has to somersault onto a train to Queenstown in Southern Ireland. She leaps from one mode of transportation to another, sprinting in the rain from boat to train. The train pulls away from the sea and ventures towards the heart of Ireland and heads south. Even in her dampened mood and weather, Liz still snags a glimmer of Ireland's misty beauty. Immediately, I am off again at full speed through a land swept with flying mists and showers of beautiful land green, even in January. And she also sees the poverty that brought so many Irish to the States. Later, I see ruddy-cheeked peasants going along the roads to church, a type I'm familiar with in America. I gaze contemplative at these sturdy young men and wonder how soon they will be New York aldermen and mayors of Chicago. How soon these rosy girls and the provincial gowns will be leaders of society in Washington. Liz stares out her window at the misty gray morning. They pass by fields of black and white cows. Gray stone walls line the roads. White thatched cottages with bright red doors dot the flat lands. Still green, even in the depths of winter. Liz thought She knew green from the tropics, but this land is truly a single mossy color. Eventually, at noon we reach Queenstown, having curved around a fair space of water and past the beautiful city of Cork. The ship has not yet arrived, but will doubtless be here in a few moments. The bad weather having delayed her, and my luggage is all hurried down to the tender. But I shall be sent off if I do not wail with hunger. After a five-hour trip going through the Emerald Isle, Liz is famished. Liz's stomach is clenching and she can't think about anything but food. She hasn't eaten for a day and a half She would have scarfed down her own shoes if they were boiled and salted and weren't her only pair. She goes out in search for anything edible. But she can't go too far, just in case she has to sprint back to catch her steamboat. With all of her items, she trudges across the street to a hotel She hopes the hotel will have a cafe, which, given her luck, the kitchen is under construction. Liz's hangriness takes on full form. After begging, pleading, crying with the staff, they offer her cold tea and stale bread. That, in her words, looks as if it has been used to scrub the floor before being presented to me as a substitute for breakfast. Liz, 
is running on fumes. The only thought that keeps her sane is getting on this boat. Once she's on the Bothana, she can have some stability, some food, and warmth. She scarfs down the bread and chugs the tea. She doesn't have time to savor this insult of a breakfast. She thanks the hotel staff and rushes back across the street. She feels a little better, but it does not fill her up. She really needs to go to the bathroom to collect herself. She feels so grimy. She still has the dust from Egypt in her hair, but her skin is damp from the British weather. Liz knows that her ship could be here in any second. So when she returns to the waiting area, she goes to the bathroom at lightning speed. God forbid she is stuck on this rainy aisle. Quickly, she returns to the waiting room, finds a spot amongst the hundreds of other passengers, and waits. And waits. And waits. These past few days from Egypt to Britain didn't feel like traveling. She was just experiencing a linear path. She somersaulted over Europe and physically crossed through five countries. But she felt like she hadn't seen any of it. Now she has too much time to think about all of the bad luck and her ill fate that brought her to the slowest ship to cross the Atlantic. And apparently, getting to the ship takes its time as well. Hour after hour goes by, but no one summons to come. I dare not move. At least the call comes during my absence and sit there hopeless, helpless, overwhelmed with hunger, lack of sleep, and fatigue. At 6 p.m., my patience is at its end. Liz starts to lose it. After waiting for six hours, her eyes are bloodshot, her stomach is rumbling, her hair is oily, and she can feel a pimple growing on her chin. And she can also feel the impatient energy of all the other passengers begin to boil. As I demand more food, when they bring the long expected notice. Right when she reached the end of her fuse, the ship is signaled. Everyone pushes and shoves their way to get on board first. Toes are stepped on, bags hit other people's arms, and everyone believes they are priority. Everyone loads onto the tender, a tiny ship that will bring them to the steamship. As everyone shoves their way onto the boat, Liz is jostled around this way and that. It rains in torrents, mingled with sleet, and the wind blows. It tempts the tender, and it whirls around like an eggshell. The wind drives us back and over and over again. We go over the passage before we can make headway against the wild weather. The tender couldn't hold up against the winds. The rain barrels down onto her as she steps onto the slowest ship on the Atlantic. Then the storm becomes apocalyptic. The ride that normally takes 30 minutes took them two and a half hours later when we get alongside the ship and I Chilled to the bone, sick and dizzy for want of food and sleep and calm. Stumble around the narrow, slippery plunge path 
that leads from one ship to another. The gangplank is slick, and everyone's mood matches the storm. And someone takes it out on Liz. No sooner have I set foot on the glassy deck than the push of an impatient passenger sends me with a smashing fall into the scrampers, where I gather bruises that last a week. A compassionate stewardess comes to the rescue and puts me to bed, speechless and on the verge of tears. Liz is done. She is wet, hungry, stressed, angry, sleep deprived. Her hair is a mess, and she is so goddamn close to being home. She hits that level of exhaustion that only comes from traveling nonstop for days on end. There comes a moment where it doesn't matter how much fun you've had. How many wonderful people and places you've seen? How much more you have to see? You just want to go home. But now, Liz is on her final leg of the journey, and she hopes that this bad luck will dissipate over the ocean. She collapses onto her bed and sobs so loudly that it matches the storm. This is too much. But she reminds herself that she just has a little longer to go. I can do it. 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 Now, ready to embark on the last leg of Liz and Nellie's respective journeys. Neither woman has any idea what is waiting for them back home. Because all of America is shaking with anticipation to know which woman will cross the finish line first. A Race Around the World was written, produced, researched, narrated, re-researched, scripted, edited, edited again, re-scripted, edited one last time, soundscaped, scored, mixed, and mastered by me, Adrian Bain. Sam Dingman was our editorial consultant and emotional support. Father Time was played by Jake Dingman. Resources include 80 Days by Matthew Goodman, In Seven Stages, A Flying Trip Around the World by Elizabeth Bisland, and for more resources, go to our website, strangersabroadpodcast.com. Please go to Apple Podcasts to rate, review, and subscribe to A Race Around the World. If you leave a review, I will read it at the end of the credits, like... Fascinating listen. Fiona and crew give it five stars and say, Wow, what a story! And this is such a great show that's telling it in such a novelistic way. Ooh, really digging into the voices and all the sounds. Great! Thank you so much, Fiona. And if you're interested in all of the bonus content, anecdotes, and historical facts that didn't get into the show, head over to our TikTok at Strangers Abroad Podcast. If you would like to email us, please send over a lovely message to strangersabroadpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. And come back next week for the final leg in the adventure of Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bisland. Safe travels to everyone listening.